Welcome to the local campaign here on Rogers TV. Thank you so much for joining us as we get closer and closer to Election Day on October 24th. We bring you your municipal debates. Today's municipal debate is Ward 24 Barhaven East. And before I introduce you to our candidates, I will go over the format of this debate. So we start off each candidate will have 60 seconds for their opening statement. The order of that chosen at random just a few moments ago. From there, we go into our debate. So we're going to go through a number of different topics, of course, topics that are important to not only the constituents, but throughout the entire city of Ottawa. I will ask a question um, to a candidate. They'll have 45 seconds to open up the discussion, and then I will open the floor to a full debate on that particular topic. Once that is done, our time is done on that, we go back to the original person with whom I asked the question. They will have 30 seconds to wrap that up. So we will go through that, um, as I said, uh, on some of the most important topics that are affecting uh, citizens and residents here in the Ottawa area. And then at the end of that, we will have our closing statements. Each candidate will have 60 seconds for their closing statements. All right, now I will introduce you to our candidates, starting with Richard Garrick. Aye. Dominic Janelle. Aye. Patrick Brennan. Hello. Kathleen Cott. Hello. Atik Qureshi. Good morning, Ottawa. Wilson Lowe. Aye. And Guy Boone. Aye. All right, so we begin with our opening statements. As I said, each candidate will have 60 seconds for their opening statement. We start with Patrick. Patrick, you have 60 seconds. Uh, sorry, Richard, my, my, my apologies. Richard Garrick, we start with you. Not a problem, thank you very much. My name is Richard Garrick and I am running to be your counselor in Barhaven East. I have called Barhaven home for 30 years. I've gone to school here, I've worked here, and I've volunteered here. I am a teacher, a former youth worker, and a nonprofit coordinator, and I've worked to advocate for our at-risk populations, taught in special education, and even been in the customer service industry. I have worked with the Ottawa Police for over 15 years running their cadet programs and have worked with other great organizations like the Lions Club, the NCC, and the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. With these experiences, I have honed my skills as an effective communicator, leader, and listener. I bring a realistic approach to this community and a strong voice. My experience will help me to advocate for the needs of the residents of Barhaven. I have worked in many different sectors which sets me apart. I've been so lucky to call Ottawa home, and Barhaven in particular. With my background, experience, and knowledge, I will be your strong voice at Council and advocate for all in this community. All right, time is up. Uh, over to Dominic Janelle. You have 60 seconds. Hi there, my name is Dominic Janelle, and I'm running to be your next city councillor for Barhaven East Ward 24, Ottawa's newest ward. Barhaven East has been experiencing a growth population and I'd like to be able to address that for City Council. I aim to bring a strong voice rooted in mental health considerations in the future of our city and to bring change in a susceptible and a responsible manner, which is to say uh, aspects of fiscal responsibility, transportation and transit. Barhaven East is a prime example of in intensification happening in our community. And to reach the 50 minute neighborhood that Ottawa would like to provide is what we need to bring forward and pivot to be the prime example for our community to export to the other suburbs of our city. Barhaven East is the perfect example of this. We came out of two different wards and to strive to be the best that Barhaven can be, both East and West, is what I like to bring as your cooperative voice on council who's not afraid to challenge the status quo. All right, thank you very much. Uh, now we have Patrick. Patrick Brennan, yeah. over to you, 60 seconds. Thanks, Derek. Uh, good morning, uh, I'm Pat Brennan and I'm running for councillor in Barhaven East. And a few of the reasons why I'm running is I feel uh, we've got to have more accountability at, at City Hall. Uh, there's been a number of issues, uh, specifically light rail transit, which I think it's important that we restore confidence in uh, our transportation system as soon as possible. As far as experience is concerned, I have been a school board trustee for six years and I was quite happy to represent Barhaven for three years and number of, a couple of high schools were built as, far, as well as elementary schools. Other issues that I'm, I'd like to address are safe communities. We need, uh, I believe, uh, more police presence in Barhaven because of the additional crime, as well as speeding. We have to get speeding under control. And finally, I have a finance background in over 30 years, 
and I raised my family in Bar Haven, so I'd like to be your counselor. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Next up is Kathleen Cott. Kathleen, you have 60 seconds. Hello, I'm Kathleen Cott, and I too am running for City Council in Bar Haven, East Ward 24. I'm a grandmother of six, a mother of three, a social just justice advocate, an author, an entrepreneur, and a retired financial consultant. I love disco music, just saying. Reading, taking my dog beacon fun walks, and above all, I love the community and the experience of Bar Haven. I was born in Victoria. My father was in the Navy, so I tended to travel a little bit throughout our country. I've lived in both ends of the, of the country, both in Victoria and in Nova Scotia. In 1967, we moved to Bell's Corners, and ever since, Ottawa has felt like home for me. Where my heart lies is in Bar Haven, where I raised my kids, and my mom was in the long-term care facility in Longfields Manor. In 1993, when we moved to Bar Haven at Woodruff and Fallowfield, it was just beginning to become developed at that point in time. And while politics and all things political I'm has sorry, found... sorry, Kathleen, your time is up. Okay, thank you. Over to Atik Qureshi. You have 60 seconds, Atik. I'm Atik Qureshi, resident of Ottawa for 17 years, happily married for 21 years, father of a teen, and a young adult. I'm in accounting and finance profession for past 26 years, worked at various positions, and currently an income tax and financial consultant. Having knowledge of law, and technology with certificates and I volunteer with community organizations and support them at financially and monetarily. I'm a teacher, a mentor and an entrepreneur. We need to bring the change the way city, hall, city, uh, city Council works and I will believe that I have skills, plannings to bring this change. On October 24, I will be your voice in the City Hall so, with your support. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Atik. Uh, next up is Wilson Lowe. Wilson, you have 60 seconds. Thanks, Derek, and thank you, Rogers, for uh, hosting this debate. Um, I share with you a very personal interest in making sure that our community has a healthy and sustainable future. My wife and I live in Barhaven East, and we're planning on raising a family here. I want my kids to grow up in a community that's safe, that's, uh, that, that lets them thrive, and that one day can become the community they raise their families in. Um, from Knowlesbrook to Heart's Desire, Longfields, Davidson Heights, Winding Way, and Chapman Mills, um, I love this community and I've served it for almost a decade as an OC Transpo employee. Um, I will represent this community I served and I'm all in. I've taken an unpaid leave of absence from work and I've forgone a salary since I registered as your candidate uh, in late June. I've um, knocked on almost 10,000 doors in that time and spoken to neighbours about how we can make our roads better, how we can make our transit better, and how to better spend the city's money, our money. Um, we cannot let our infrastructure and services fall behind as our community continues to grow rapidly. I'm very excited to share my vision for Barhaven East with you and uh, I look forward to doing so. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson. And uh, lastly, we have Guy Boone. Guy, you have 60 seconds. Hi, my name is Guy Boone and I'm a uh, safety engineer uh, with LRT Experience. Uh, I brand myself as Safety Guy. Um, I've lived in Barhaven for uh, 27 years and uh, raised my family here and uh, I've been a volunteer in uh, many uh, community associations in our community as well as uh, served on school council. Uh, I was even invited by the, uh, the public board to serve on a, uh, a working group to, uh, to, for the expansion of the long fields to include uh, grade 7 and 8. Uh, in the past five years, I stepped up to serve my profession, uh, Professional Engineers Ontario, as the Eastern Regional Councillor, and that gave me good experience in governance. Uh, my priorities are safety, transportation, uh, smart initiatives, quality of life, and uh, I bring accountability and transparency. Thank you. And I'm honoured to serve as your upcoming councillor. Thank you. Thank you to all of our candidates. Now we move into the debate portion. Um, we're going to start with Richard. Richard, I'll send the topic to you. You'll have 45 seconds, and then everybody will have an opportunity to jump in. Each candidate has mentioned public transportation in the LRT, so let's start with that. Uh, people want reliable, affordable, and accessible 
public transit. Uh, there's also some debate on with the cost of whether they should be bringing the LRT out to Barhaven. People have been talking about that as well. But let's talk about public transportation overall. How would you help achieve some of those goals I just mentioned? And what is your position on free transit for all? Over to you, Richard. Well, thank you very much for the question. You know, First, as a city, we need to review our transit system. Uh, everything from paratransport to the LRT. We can't use a system that doesn't work. Residents are frustrated with wait times, missing buses, and even having to transfer multiple times. We must be transparent and communicate with residents and advocate for those needs while also talking to drivers as they know the system better than anybody. You know, we need to look at local routes and focus on how to make our system efficient. When it comes to free transit, it's important to know that transit costs will be put somewhere. Example would be your income, your taxes. You know, do residents want a $480 to $1,000 tax bill added to their uh, mortgages and their taxes as the cost of living is on the rise? I think not. All right, so now we open it up to the floor. Um, candidates, please feel free to jump in at any time. I don't know if I, I can do this. The but plan no. which I am proposing, because I'm not convinced with the way they are putting the Barhaven uh, LRT phase three to Barhaven because uh, there is a big span of five kilometers from Hunt Club to Woodruff. We have no population over there. But uh, if you uh, we look at the Bar 24, within five kilometers, we are having almost 30,000 population. So LRT existing plan will run on that area. There is no population for that. I was, I was convinced last time and I am still convinced that being a supporter of public and private partnerships. I want to sit with VRL or CN Railway. We'll bring the commuter trains, utilize the existing railway line, and connect so the bar havens with the downtown. I have to ask, we don't own those lines. Those are federal lines. How do we use something that doesn't belong to us? One, we already know that there's concerns in Barhaven when it comes to transportation, transit, and trains. Uh, that's a touchy subject in our neighborhood. We can't use federal lines. You know, we need to build our infrastructure. And saying that there's nobody between Hunt Club and Woodruff, that's a good thing. That's our green belt, which we need to protect. But at the same time, we know that Barhaven is growing. We are getting closer and closer to Mantic, and we must need, meet those needs of that community. We have students. You know, as a teacher, I send my students to Algonquin College, Carleton University in Ottawa, where I've also traveled on the, those buses and trains. And I know how effective that has to be. We can't just use a system that doesn't belong to us. Okay, anyone else want to jump in here? Yep, Kathleen. as well, I think uh, the Indigenous community is still not uh, given their blessing as to whether or not we'll be able to proceed. So that's still in discussions. And I think that that's something that we have to be mindful of going forward as well. I also don't think there's, um, talking about this subject, I don't think we're incentivized enough to actually take public transportation, not just because um, whether it's free or not free or whether it's dependable or not dependable, it's just that we uh, have an addiction to our cars. We have defined our identities with cars and we need to try and wean ourselves off of cars. And uh, my suggestion has been to introduce the Communa Auto um, shared um, uh, mobility opportunities around the community to allow people instead of buying the second car for the teenagers that are using your car all the time they get a commune auto membership for twenty dollars okay, anyone else want to jump yeah, in here I'll, go ahead yeah, thanks Derek uh, first of all to the one question that you mentioned was uh, uh, free transit I don't support that I think there's a, a lot of subsidization already to light rail and OC transpo that uh, I wouldn't be in favor of free, free transit Second of all, I think uh, as far as LRT is concerned, firstly, we have to sit down and speak to staff and all the different providers of the services that put on LRT. Because right now there seems to be a lot of acrimony and there's a bit of blame game going on uh, as reported in the media. So I think firstly, we've got to say, okay, we want to turn the page on this. We want to first find out what are the issues. The public hearings we had uh, this past summer will report in November which I'm looking forward to seeing. And from there, I say, okay, what's wrong? Let's fix it. Let's move forward with LRT. Anybody else want to jump the in problem here? Is yeah, go ahead, contract that doesn't really, we're, we're, we're locked in a contract for 30, well, for another 20 something years that doesn't really mm -hmm. allow this company to come out and speak um, about what's going on, or it doesn't allow the city to demand this transparency and accountability, accountability excuse me, that you speak of. And uh, in terms of your, in terms of Atik's uh, point about there being no population for the five kilometers between Hunt Club and, and uh, Fallowfield, there's, we have a four-lane Woodruff, we have a four-lane road there, Woodruff Avenue, which also has no population in that section. So 
by, by saying the LRT will be pointless in that area, by saying there's no population, you're also saying that Woodruff Avenue is therefore pointless. And the same goes for Greenbank, same goes for Merrillville, same goes for Prince of Wales and Cedarview and Highway 416 even. Guy, you want so, to jump in here? Yeah, so I, I'd like to uh, speak to the issue of the reliability of the LRT. Um, my, my personal sense is that if we had more engineers on council, we could have uh, not been in this mess that we're currently in. Uh, the LRT is a, uh, is a nation building project and it's more to it than just forcing a deadline, which is what the current council did was force a deadline and, and force the, the, the consortium to, to deliver when it's, a, it's a, a complex system. So certainly as a, as a safety engineer and safety has been a, a big issue with the, uh, with the current phase of the LRT. Uh, I'd like to also uh, bring some light to the fact that we have an on piece, on, unfinished piece of, of work uh, as a result of the, plane, the, train and, uh, the train and bus collision at Woodruff and Fallowfield. And I'm, I'm hoping and counting on phase three to resolve that issue. But as we've seen on Greenbank and uh, Strandard, we do need grade separation. Okay, I, I just want Dominic wants to jump in here. Go ahead, Dominic. I do agree with Guy there. Uh, thank you there for mentioning the uh, the accident that happened in 2013, uh, where a Ottawa Transit bus collided with a Via Rail passenger train, in which six people lost their lives. Uh, sadly, um, which is to say that. LRT is still a great thing coming to Barhaven. It's one of the suburbs in which I do believe would benefit from it. Canada is the other one as primarily we are the two suburbs underserved by our public transit. And to reinvigorate the reliability would be to provide this quality of service having implemented the findings of the public inquiry released in November 30th. I spoke out of the public inquiry in stage one back in May and to have these changes implemented would bring that reliable, trans reliable transit to Barhaven and as well as to incorporate in the new Ottawa plan the fact that uh, in, uh, to bring an efficient transportation system to Barhaven Centre, which would bring a provision an efficient multimodal transportation network. And that's what we should be pioneering while bringing Barhaven the LRT Stage 3. At this point, I would like to address a couple of uh, colleagues' questions. That, uh, one, that at this time, transit is working taking all the peoples to the downtown core. We need to revisit the transit, uh, uh, transit pattern and connect all the suburb community. I'm sorry, I take we, I, I've got to cut you off. That's, that's all the time we have for this. But um, <laughs> coming back to Richard, you do have 30 seconds to wrap up this topic. Perfect, thank you. Uh, you know, I do have to agree, but we also have to realize in that Woodruff, Mayor, uh, Woodruff to Hunt Club Quarter, there's Maryville Gardens. People do uh, live there, so we need to keep that in mind. You know, uh, We need to rebuild faith in our transit system from all aspects. We need to listen not only to our riders, but our drivers and hear their concerns. We need to review our tracking system as to make sure that our system is more effective. And we must continue to invest in our transit while looking at cost reduction and efficiencies, electric buses, hybrid buses. You know, We need this to be the best system it can be in Canada as a nation's capital. All right, thank you very much to all of our candidates. We'll move on to the next topic. We start the topic with you, Dominic. You will have 45 seconds. Uh, the topic is concern over the city's growing debt. There's a lot of concern over the city's growing debt. Where would you set tax increases over the next four years? Taking that into account, you have 45 seconds to begin. So with the growing debt with the City of Ottawa, um, it's important to recognize that the City of Ottawa is, is a $6 billion corporation. It employs 17,000 people and it has a lot of money spread around a bunch of services. What I would like to bring is a tax freeze, a one-year tax freeze in which restricts the spending on which restricts ta the tax increases to keep it stable for the first year. The main importance behind this is that the pandemic has been hard on our citizens and we've still had to had tax increases continuously throughout this. Long, our residents have been hurting through pensions and, and now into a 40 year record high inflation. They're hurting and it's about time we give everyone a break and during that time, do a budgetary review. Okay, thank you, Dominic. I now open the floor. Anyone feel free to jump in. Go ahead, Wilson. If we freeze our taxes, yes, it, will, it might bring stability to a lot of families for the first year, but what you're um, setting them up for is f future years of instability because we're going to have to pay for that uh, tax freeze because our city services still need to continue uh, to be funded. Uh, so city services like our emergency services, our transit, our parks, our roads need to continue to be maintained. And uh, furthermore, it's yes, it's a $6 billion, uh, $6 billion budget, but it's, we still have to fund it responsibly. We need to look at this budget and make sure that we're 
responsibly continuing to fund it instead of going for these uh, easy topics like a tax freeze because we will have to confront this later on and this will actually just bring more instability well, so in, I think, in future years. I think years. we also have to look at the fact that inflation is rising. We have costs for the city that are increasing. Putting a tax freeze right now, we don't know where our budgets are. We don't know where things are going because of this. Inflation and cost of living for everybody. This is a great opportunity to increase our community programs and increase options for our members of community to be engaged in City of Ottawa. And you know, balancing that cost, you know, being able to go swimming for a low cost rather than having to build a pool. You know, keeping families and life affordable in Barhaven is crucial. We've seen this in the rise of cost of living. You know, taxes uh, over the last 10 years have on average been about 2.5 to 2.6 percent. That's a reasonable cost. But we also have to make sure that whatever we do, our city is still able to function and run. We need to make sure that our police have the resources and tools that they need. We need to make sure our fire trucks are working and that we're investing in our agriculture. We're investing in our local uh, economy. You know, we can't just say we're going to freeze taxes because I, I must admit, I do agree, we're going to be run into problems down the road where we then have to pay for things. Uh, you know, look at Ben Franklin's plans from uh, All right, let's, uh, Kathleen, you want to jump in here? Yeah, I would like to jump in and, and really, um, yeah, our budget was set uh, and approved on December the 8th of 2021 and since then we've had a multitude of things take place, some out of our control. Um, like what was happening in January and February, the weather conditions, some other events that are occurring along the way. So we really don't even know if we have any money. And I think the most important thing we have to do, and, and I'm in agreement with this in the first 100 days, to take a review, take a look from the top to the bottom, line by line, and make sure that we are um, you know, having a, a good responsible approach in terms of how we're going to go forward. So having any to. responsible um, uh, reactions to uh, what should we be doing? It cannot happen until we know exactly Listen, what we're doing. I, I agree that the fact that you have City, to review the, the system. No, no, let's let's let uh, Atik jump in here. Uh, Go ahead. That's okay. That uh, I'm convinced that we should give a break to the residents of the people. Give it a break for a one-year freeze. Uh, one thing everybody should know that uh, MPAC do the assessment of the property. Increase in property value, property tax uh, assess will be automatically having, city will automatically having excess resources. So we can That's utilize those true. resources uh, effectively. So, and also, if we control the, and uh, thoroughly uh, do the audit process and bring the accountability in the city hall, we can cut the cost where various, uh, uh, various costs has been utilized for uh, non, uh, Sorry. No, that's okay. a guy or Patrick, okay. do you want to jump in here? Either of you? Just go ahead, Pat. Yeah, I, you know, certainly uh, I'm, you know, one that talks about fiscal responsibility. Get, so I want to keep taxes uh, to a minimum, you know, any tax increase. But essentially the you residents know, of uh, Barhaven and, and Ottawa want our core services to be delivered effectively and efficiently and feel value for their money. So I think that we have to look at, uh, you know, what what is the city spending all their money on, and just look at that and say, you know, is that is that uh, necessary, you know, going f going forward. So I think that, um, you know, I'm going to keep the tax freeze to uh, not tax freeze, but the taxes down. But I think it's important, as Richard said, uh, with inflationary pressures on fuel and oil. We know this past uh, this past year. Uh, I think you've got to look at that and say, okay, we keep it down, but we may have to cut services. Okay, Guy, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, I just want to say that we, we need to be responsible. So uh, doing a review and make sure that we're spending money in the right places. Um, I also uh, believe as an engineer that we need to be strategic with our, uh, with our finances, make sure that we're getting uh, value from from uh, strategic opportunities, uh, you know, where we can do more with less. So in general, you know, I, I, I think we have to be responsible, but make sure that we're spending the money in the right places. Wilson, I'll go to you because I know you, you want to jump in and then I'll, I'll come to you, Richard. Go ahead, Wilson. Yeah, and a, a lot of you have been mentioning a budget review, but the problem is we have a 2023 budget that needs to be uh, approved by within 45 days after any, you know, any one of us take office. And to review a $6 billion budget, as Dominic uh, mentioned, um, that covers our emergency services, uh, we have to, uh, that covers our emergency services, our transportation, our transit, our maintenance, our parks, paying our employees, and not, not to mention to make recommendations, to make changes, to present it for public consultation, to discuss it at council, that's not going to take 45 days. That will take a lot longer. Richard, go ahead. So we have to review. Uh, there's no doubt about that. As any incoming council should be, we should be reviewing what's happened in the past and being knowledgeable as we move forward. We can't just sit back. Our 
our services have to run and residents don't want us to stall. They've already seen stalling with, you know, LRT and funding for those things. We need to move forward with our budgets. You know, it is always the right common sense approach to review things as a new job. That's your responsibility as a councillor. But we still have to move forward. We need to ensure that our systems are working and the residents of Ottawa are getting what they deserve locally through community services and more. Okay, Kathleen, you want to jump? Yep, and I also think that we should be looking at uh, introducing the concept, and I think Ben Franklin had this concept in the past, the user pay model. So, for example, um, commercial uh, use of the uh, roads that are overused as it is, Fallowfield, Prince of Wales, and what have you, um, having commercial vehicles having to pay a user pay model in order to be able to create alternative ways of uh, funding the costs that are available. You okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just yes, going to close it there because we only have 10 seconds left, but I'm, I'm going to come back to Dominic. Dominic, you have 30 seconds to wrap up on this topic. To bring it back together, we do know where our city finances are. The city debt has tripled over the past decade, close to $3.5 billion, with around $240 million in interest, which has been susceptible to inflation. So we know where our budget is, we know where it's going, and is it possible to do it within 45 days? It is. To review it all would mean what I would propose is a one-year tax freeze on taxes, fees, and, and non-discretionary non spending so that we can do our budgetary review to be fiscally responsible. All right. Okay, that's time for that topic. Uh, we move on to the next topic, and Patrick, you'll be starting this. You'll have 45 seconds. Let's talk affordable housing. It's been a big issue, a big topic that many people have been talking about. Um, how would you address the immediate need for affordable housing and affordable rental housing? How do you think we should go about achieving that goal? You have 45 seconds to open. Yes, that's a yeah, very difficult topic, uh, Derek, just because uh, there's so many things that impact it. Um, certainly, you want to let the market sort of take, you know, dictate to a certain point uh, if somebody has an investment property, income property, uh, they've got to have so much rent to cover the uh, the cost of providing that. So that, that's that's one thing. As far as affordable housing, I think we have to uh, look at our partners, uh, the provincial government and the federal government, for help. Uh, the property taxpayer, um, as Dominic mentioned earlier, a three and a half billion dollar deficit in the city of Ottawa. We've got to be careful on how we spend money. So we really need help from other levels of government to just arbitrarily. Uh, roll out affordable housing. Okay, time's up. Thank you very much, Patrick. I open the floor to all candidates. Feel free to jump in. Go ahead, Kathleen. Housing is a human right, and we do have a national housing strategy that is aiming to ensure that people all have a home. But um, we need to do more than that. There's a Swedish model that allows for people who are on um, in a public housing environment to actually be contributing to society as well to offset the different costs that they may not have enough to, to complete you know their day-to-day -day, uh, requirements. I'm suggesting also to put in into every public housing area um, year-round greenhouses or vertical hydroponic systems so that people can be having their own food that they're creating there and if they have access they can either donate it to the food bank or to the groceries the same with um, high schools and the same with assisted living to try and create at least the methodology to have people being able to remember to take care of themselves and not look to other people to do everything for them. Give Just them a reminder to all the candidates so, feel free to jump in okay let's so go uh, over to Richard. One of the things we need to look at is we also as you know somebody's just mentioned we do need to work with our partners not just federally provincially but also locally we need to look for nonprofit developers uh, with a, a proven track record that can help build these these homes uh, and as a city we have a lot of opportunities to our land to sell this land at a low cost and uh, you know offer affordable housing uh, you know a great example of that is Jockvale and Longfields they're putting community housing in at Jockvale and Longfields and that land was sold to a local proven nonprofit developer for two dollars not at a profit so that we can get people into homes. We also need to look at you know, wraparound services. Do these areas have access to transit, food, mental health services, community resources? You know, these residents don't just want to be put somewhere that they don't feel like they're a member of the community. We need to engage in that. And we also need to engage with those communities to hear what they're saying because our wait lists are really long. Uh, you know, this also brings up the idea of revitalizing the downtown core. We have an opportunity there that we need to look at. It might not be the, the perfect option, but we need to look at it as a city council and ensure that our residents have the best Atik, places go to ahead. Live. City business model is at this time building new houses, building new units, and generate revenue for that. Now, where we are having a builder-centric business model, 
Uh, I will suggest that city should allocate the lands uh, for uh, building new uh, affordable housing units and uh, restrict the builders that if they are going to build a 100 house in a community, they should at least 15% house to be built and that allocated land for uh, the affordable housing. So they should, then they will get the contract and go on for their uh, uh, current project anywhere in the city. Who else so that is my suggestion. Go ahead, uh, Wilson, go ahead. And, and I agree with uh, Patrick and with Richard that we do need to work with our provincial and federal partners, but it's not just working with them. We, sorry, we, it is working with them, but we also need to explore things like a rent subsidy. But on the local level, something we can do and we should do is uh, implement more inclusionary zoning that um, allows a better supply of affordable, both affordable and subsidized housing so that people have uh, more options. You know, a lot of people that uh, at the doors that I've spoken to have said they're, they're afraid their kids won't be able to uh, uh, live in Barhaven, in the community they grew up in. And uh, we, we, we can also advocate for more supports with those uh, partners in our federal and provincial governments for better ODSP and OW Dominic, supports. go ahead. Jump in. I agree with Wilson on that regard, and as well as uh, Patrick, uh, or my apologies, Richard didn't bring up a great example of the Jockvale and Longfields development by a nonprofit. It's really the fact that by 2046, the city of Ottawa is going to be increasing by 420,000 people, which going to be a rough ball estimate of 200,000 extra homes that we need. Barhaven East is an intensified ward in which we are quite stable in our housing situation. One situation that's not unfortunate is Barhaven West and Riverside South Finley Creek. That's where we need to invest in our affordable housing and through multiple uses of multimodal houses to single detached units to as well as condominiums. So to provide different alternatives and as well as under rezoning, but to make sure that it's affordable housing that's rentable properties, that's for Ottawa citizens, so we don't have to have more multi-generational households, as Wilson mentioned, in which a kid living with their parents might not be able to move out because they just simply cannot afford it. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to stop you there. Guy, do you want to jump in and then Kathleen, I'll come to you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, I think we need to think about smart uh, means to, uh, to solve this problem. Uh, you know, we need to, uh, it, housing needs to be affordable and uh, we, uh, you know, we need to, uh, we need to make sure that we have supply for the demand that we're, we're uh, seeing. Okay, Kathleen, go ahead. Well, I also want to just point out that right in our own backyard, we have people that are living in the motel over at Prince of Wales and Fallowfield. They don't have a safe place to walk on Prince of Wales. They can't actually get to groceries very effectively from that location. So I think that we have to be mindful of people that are already in our community that we're not representing very well and I want to make sure that we consider these people as well as part of our community. So I mean listen I, I've been a teacher I've been a youth worker I've been into these homes and we're not just talking about affordable housing for people in Barhaven we're talking about across the spectrum we're talking about affordable housing from emergency housing to in the downtown core uh, to rental subsidies to owning a property it is a full spectrum in this city and it is a city problem it's not a neighborhood problem and you know within that we not only have to treat these people with respect because they are you know having a time in their lives but we also need to do what is best for them yeah I have to admit you know looking at outside areas is fantastic but we also have Nepean community housing in Barhaven with rental subsidies how can we best support them not just building houses but supporting people that are already in place and organizations that are also already in place you know through funding through community access Access, engagement. We need to engage with these people. 30 seconds left. Anyone else want to jump in before I go back to Patrick? Go ahead, Don. Yeah, it's a great point mentioned by uh, Richard that it really is the engagement with these people and to make sure that it really is a local and solution for our, the affordable housing crisis and make sure that every suburb can be having their own plan for it, which is to say that with the Barhaven downtown secondary plan, it's imperative that we do have the engagement with those local Nepean Housing Corporation. All right, we'll wrap it up there, but I'll come back to you. Patrick, you'll have 30 seconds to wrap up on this topic. Okay, thanks, Derek. Uh, as I mentioned before, affordable housing is, it is a tricky issue, and we do need our partners from the provincial and the federal level. As well, uh, a big problem with uh, housing in general is a supply issue. Uh, there's been a shortage of supply. We've had a number of new Canadians and we're not keeping up with the supply to provide the proper housing. So I do agree that we want to find local solutions and, and, and you know, provide housing. But, uh, you know, the supply issue is, is very real. So we have to help right. that out. 
Okay, thank, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, that does it for this, uh, this topic. Uh, we'll move on to the next topic, and I will start with Kathleen Cott. Um, we've talked a lot about public transportation, but, you know, people are using their cars, and there's a long list of roads that, that do need attention. Um, how do we ensure that the worst of those get the attention that they need while scheduling other infrastructure, which is, you know, quite frustrating to many residents in Ottawa? Kathleen, you have 45 seconds to open up this topic. Okay, so one of the things that I've been kind of uh, doing some research on is that um, Amazon has a location distribution center at 416 um, serving a large area. We also have one at Boundary Road, and then we have these two hubs in between. So they're using our infrastructure in order to be able to not only go through the highways but also across town to from one one distribution center to the other and it's putting a lot of extra pressure on our infrastructure on those roads Fallowfield being one Prince of Wales being another and my suggestion has been through regulation 586 which does exist in in uh, the province of Ontario for um, uh, charging those that are using the... Uh, I'm sorry, Kathleen, you'll have to come back to that. Uh, you'll, you'll have some more sorry. time, but uh, feel free to jump in. Anybody, Wilson, talking about want, okay. the, if sorry. we do that, like Amazon right now is uh, Barhaven's largest employer. Um, in fact, it, Barhaven has a distinct lack of a major employer, and Amazon has kind of jumped in and filled that void. And if you want to deliberately tax or somehow charge them extra to use our roads, our infrastructure, you're only going to drive out. Um, you're only going to drive out these employers and future opportunities for uh, future employers. Excuse me, uh, as well. Richard, how do you want to? You know, I, looking at 586, you also have to believe in people's rights and that they could charter challenge this. This is uh, access to movement and freedom. They could argue this. I'm not saying that that's what they're going to do, but that could bring us into a legal argument that we need to be aware of that could possibly take place. You know, we should be engaging with our contract partners to do more. You know, finding examples when we're paving Green Bank to Fallowfield, why are they not also looking at the paths next to it? Not only will this save time, but money, and it'll make residents happier as the jobs get done faster. Um, you know, we know we need infrastructure. I live in the oldest part of the ward uh, between Foxfield and Green Bank, and I see it every day. Uh, and that, again, takes engagement with our provincial and federal partners, as well as our community associations, to plan ahead and not just deal with the right there and now. We need to be proactive, not reactive, when it comes to fixing our infrastructure. Anybody else? Matik, go ahead. As I said earlier, that we need to change the approach the city works. Uh, we don't need to fix the roads once people start crying for that. So we need to do a preemptive measures. Right now, we need to widen the fallow field all the way to the Prince of Wales. So before the, before the traffic or community population will increase and start using it, they, we will have the road to utilize it. It's not like the way the Green Bank is now, they are building it. All the area has been built in, on the promises of their, for the widening of roads. And when, once the population will be there, they start out crying for that, for the need, then city move in and start building the roads. So we need to change this approach. We need to take a preemptive approach, uh, understand how much uh, houses are building, are going to be built there, how much traffic flow will come, and at what time we need to start widening the road. So okay, this I'm is something just I will go to learn, Dominic and, and Guy, will, I'll come to you. Go, go ahead, Dom. The widening of a roads is a great is a great solution to what Barhaven is currently facing because we've had an incredible growth population and yet our infrastructure has not kept up with this. Back when Prince of Wales as a part of the city of Nepean, that was supposed to be a major highway for the for the ward. But what we've seen is that it's our needs change, the situation changes, and we need our infrastructure to reflect this in kind. I can think of already even on Lodge Road, in which already has massive potholes and which are scheduled to be fixed, but they're going to take its time. And I already know that infrastructure in the Ash, uh, Ashdale, Ashvale, and Rideau Glen communities are underserved and under maintenance. And it's a complaint they have all the time. They even have uh, their street lights not working on in those communities, which okay, is. Okay, Tony, uh, I'm just going to let Guy jump in here. Thank you. Yeah. So um, uh, certainly with the uh, the LRT coming, we need to re look at how the the routes are set up and um, make sure that we got uh, priority lanes for for buses to go to like the park and rides and uh, even in, in our community we have park and rides that are not really being used uh, very much so uh, we need to make sure that we're, we're we're taking advantage of the infrastructure that we have uh, I'm also concerned about the uh, the facility that the Amazon facility that's being proposed uh, it's going to 
uh, affect our traffic. Uh, there's trucks that are going to be coming through our community, and uh, I, I'm concerned with the way the, the current council approved that, that, that uh, application. They did it in a two-stage process where they told us at the first stage there was no uh, there was no proponent, and then later we find out, like in a very short time, that there was a proponent, and now we even see what the facility looks like. So I'm really concerned. I think the new council needs to revisit that decision because I'm not sure it's the right decision that was made. Ajit, go ahead. I agree with the guy that uh, the new truck facility, they, we have to go and revisit the things because uh, this is not, uh, it should not be in the residential uh, residential area but the, thing is the best place for them area. is the across their own facility park at 416 park. at the moody drives that is the best place in my opinion they should move that one and for that uh, maryville business park uh with my plan which i'm coming to reduce the cost for building uh 3.5 billion for lrt uh i am looking a hospital in that maryville business so park. here's the thing okay yeah. Patrick, very quickly and then i'll come to wilson Patrick, oh. did you want to jump in? I think it was Richard. Yeah. No, but I, uh, you, we haven't heard from you yet, so I, I thought that you, you might want to get in there before you run out of time. Yeah, but okay. go, ahead, go ahead then, Richard. Yeah. Go ahead, Listen, and then you know, we can't just move this. The project is done. I, do I agree with that project? I agree. You know, it was not done correctly. We now need to look at mitigating those factors between speeding, roads, uh, looking at how we reduce noise, light pollution, uh, as we move forward with our city planners and our partners. You know, we can't just move something to another ward. That is not one responsible. And you know, in, you've mentioned moving it to a different ward. That may mean new environmental assess uh, assessments, uh, new transit issues. We need to now work with what we have and talk with our partners, talk with our community groups, talk with other councillors in the ward. And when it comes to building a hospital, that's provincial and federal. Do we support it? Yeah, but we need to be better looking at how to attract doctors and medical staff into our city. You know, they go to university at the University of Ottawa. Why can't we attract, make the city attractive that they stay building that, you know, bridge to better healthcare, but back to the transit part, it's just not feasible. We need to look at safety moving forward rather than wasting more taxpayers' dollars on reassessing this park that's already Patrick, going go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, as far as uh, roads are concerned, um, most people I talk to, they, they're, they're in favor of having a, a you know a schedule where their road can be reserviced uh, in a period of time that doesn't take too long you know and there was, there was a number of people that spoke at the door lately as far as the uh, South Maryville uh, business park is concerned um, there were three to four thousand uh, signatures on a petition that did not support that specific uh, rezoning so I think that uh, that's that's important because it's, it's right in that it's right in the community and I think we should revisit it uh, when we go to council. Okay, we'll wrap it up there. Sorry, Dominic, we've run out of time. Kathleen, you have 30 seconds to wrap up on the topic. We have to incentivize ourselves to not use our cars. So I'm not in favor of widening to four lanes. In Prince of Wales, but to try and even cross the street in Prince of Wales to put your children on a, on a bus, it's very dangerous. There's no sidewalks. There's no place for bicycles. And at nighttime, it's extremely dangerous. So I am in favor of trying to do something for Prince of Wales to make that more make sense. Um, Reducing, not increasing, is what we should be looking at. Trying to get people out of their cars. Okay, and that is our time. Thank you very much, Thank Kathleen. Um, we're going to start with uh, Atik on, on this next one, the environment and climate change. Uh, a big topic that people have been talking about quite a bit in this campaign so far. What can we do on a municipal level to make this a greener city? You have 45 seconds to open up the conversation. And again, just a reminder, this is our last uh, topic uh, for debate. So please feel free to jump in at any time after a tea. Go ahead, a tea. Uh, I'm a great supporter for a hybrid approach. Uh, we can't be on the one, we can't put all the eggs in one plate. So hybrid approach mean that uh, we have to utilize the city resources so we can uh, effectively produce the result of that. I was not, uh, uh, I was shocked by the decision of the previous uh, council when they approved the atomic waste dump at the Chalk River. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, a, I'm a physics st student, so I know uh, what uh, atomic radiation will do down the road and our children will be suffer for that. 
and they will curse us for this, what we will do with, uh, we are going to do with them in future. Second, environmental hazard, uh, the truck yard, yes, for sure, that is our community. Okay, sorry, that's, uh, that's it for the opening. Um, feel free to jump in, it's open to all candidates. In, um, in my work with uh, community associations for environmental sustainability, which hosted two mayoral debates on the environment into what can be done for our city and for the future, it's really that we can be doing so much more. What we've seen is from our extreme weather events, our power grid is not reliable. What we can be doing is having more reliable green energy and a better efficient power grid to supply residents. And as well as under Hydro Ottawa, they would like to see EV charging stations, e-bike e -bike charging stations on cost recovery basis installed throughout the city uh, by 2030, which is would be a great incentive for citizens to transition to EV vehicles and as well as the city fleet of ambulances and all services transition to electric and hybrid vehicles is the way forward. I think it comes down to infrastructure. This is another opportunity where, as we look at infrastructure, we can plan ahead. Uh, you know, you're talking about EV charging stations. I was recently overseas, and in England, they are putting EV charging ports into the light post. So as a light post gets refixed, they put a charging system in it. This is where it comes down to smart planning. Uh, you know, we do need to invest in our uh, green environment and our culture, you know, by retrofitting our buildings, looking for grants, working with partners such as the federal government to also offer homeowners those options. Uh, you know, uh, we do need to be ready for natural disasters. And a great option here, you know, look last night, just in the east part of Barhaven, we lost power for about 10 minutes in a wide area near the Vimy Bridge. We need to, to look at putting generators and emergency options into our community centers to best meet the needs, you know, like we've seen in 2018 and uh, recently in June. Um, we need to look at the city as a whole and fix everything that we can in a sustainable, reliable and cost effective measure. Just jump in. Go ahead, Kathleen. Um, I think we also have to recognize we lost a lot of trees in this last uh, um, weather conditions that we had in the spring and trying to replace all those trees is going to be a, a big project. But I also think that we should be aiming towards being able to have our 15 minute communities with tree canopy so that when you're walking on the sidewalk in 41 degree temperatures that we at least have some shade from the trees over over our heads. And I think that uh, that should be something that we work towards. I am in agreement with Atik that we should not be having atomic waste uh, situation in uh, on the Ottawa River. It's on a fault line. So I don't understand the logic of why that would even have been considered, but it seems to be an ongoing discussion. I'm going to go to Patrick because uh, he had his hand up as well here, Kathleen. Okay. Sorry. All right, thanks. Yeah, as far as uh, climate change, the one thing I am supporting is uh, the city's transition to EVs and hybrid types of vehicles. But uh, a bigger issue, really, once again, is funding. Um, I think that uh, federal and provincial governments have to step up infrastructure. Uh, is it's critical we have to have the charging stations I met a lady the other night who had an electric vehicle she wanted to visit uh, her daughter up north and they were reluctant to take the vehicle because there's only a couple charging spots en route so that's a serious issue so I think if you know there's so much talk about the environment and I'm in favor of the environment but I don't see a, as much commitment from other levels that, that uh, would, would help the municipality of, of, uh, of Ottawa Wilson go ahead I exactly, I agree with you. I, I, I visit my mom in uh, north of Toronto every, every so often and before I bought my car I rent cars and one of the options was an electric vehicle and I thought I'd get stuck on Highway 7 in Peterborough somewhere. But uh, no, it, it, these are great points about uh, securing our future for our kids and making sure that we have an environment that they can live in, planting trees along our, our, uh, along our streets, or along bare parts of our uh, parks as well. But we also need to ensure that our green spaces are preserved in new developments. Um, the city has lots of tools at its disposal to ensure that new developments come with a certain percentage of green space, that we preserve our existing green spaces, places like the Chapman Mills uh, Conservation Area, places like Nepean Woods, these are gems within our community that we need to protect um, from, um, from, from development. And uh, in, they're, they're right about the resiliency that we need to uh, implement into our infrastructure, into our buildings, and, and even um, having a plan to just address, the, uh, address the climate emergencies, sorry, address uh, extreme weather events for, uh, for residents when, when it happens. Anyone else want to jump in here? Guy, sorry, did, did you? Yeah, I, I'd like to... Um say that yes the uh, the climate is very important and uh, we've, we've been having a lot of uh, events and uh, power outages and uh, so we need to make sure that our our um, 
our hydro and, uh, and, and we're promoting uh, uh, greener um, sources of energy and uh, because really, uh, you know, th things are getting worse. Right. Okay, Richard, do you want to jump in? I own an electric vehicle. It's my second vehicle. I love it. You know, it has provided a lot of options for me. So, you know, I am really supportive of, of looking at these measures to ensure that we can grow with our green energy technology. And we should also be investing in bringing green energy partners to the city, uh, you know, small business-wise and large business-wise to not only drive our infrastructure, but our economy. You know, as a city and as a national capital, uh, we have the responsibilities to be leaders in providing effective, workable, realistic solutions uh, when it comes to the environment and climate change. And, and that's just plain and simple. Anybody else? Dominic, go ahead. Couldn't agree more, Richard. Um, it really is the fact that we are the capital city and we have the chance to set the standard for the rest of Canada, including Toronto, including Montreal, by providing a working EV electrical grid with reliable generators, with backup emergency generators if things go wrong, to transition Canada into that green capital of the world. We are a G7 capital, and I say it's about time we have pride in it. We can make the change into a green pioneer of the next technological revolution if we so willed it by electing councillors who would push for it. And I would like to push for that because electrical, it's renewable. It's the way of the future. Our fossil fuel industries can be exported to the rest of the world, but we should be striving to be better. Anybody else want to jump in before Atik wraps this? I think on that note, it also comes with a sense of we need to be sustainable and responsible, and that comes down to taxpayers' dollars. Uh, and you know that's where our community partners come in, and they play a, a massive role. Okay, that. excellent. Thank you all. Uh, Atik, you have 30 seconds to wrap up on the topic. As I said earlier, I will explore the opportunity to revisit the decision for uh, the dumping of atomic waste at Chalk River. If there is any legal obligation, I will take it. We'll look into that. Also. Uh, Electrical vehicles, it sounds very good, uh, but uh, we can't uh, experience the California, what is going on right now. They ban the gasoline vehicles, and now they ban the people to charge the uh, electric vehicles. So we have to go for the hybrid approach. That I'm sorry, that's, that's time, Atik. Thank you very much. Uh, it's now time for our closing statements. I'll do that in reverse order of what we started. So Guy Boone, you have 60 seconds for your closing statement. Yes, uh, thank you again to Rogers and my colleagues for tonight's, uh, today's uh, debate. Uh, I just want to um, say that, uh, you know, I, I personally have uh, been very active in the community and I uh, feel that I'm prepared to take this next step. I think we need uh, at least uh, an engineer on council to, to be able to make the uh, the kind of decisions we need um, going forward uh, to to uh, to deal with the LRT, the to accommodate uh, affordable housing, uh, public transit, and even uh, just the regular transit. So certainly, my priorities are safe uh, safety. We need a, a safe community environment infrastructure. We need to have meaningful and uh, effective uh, transit and transportation. We need to have quality of life, smart initiatives, and transparency and accountability. I, I Thank trust. you, Guy. Thank you very much. Uh, Wilson, over to you. You have 60 seconds. Yeah, thanks again, uh, Derek and Rogers, for hosting this debate. Um, I am the compassionate and caring neighbor you can count on to lead our community through uh, successes and challenges. The accessible and respectful counselor who will listen to your concerns for, uh, and ideas rather, for a safer and better Barhaven East, or even just a friendly person to have a conversation with. Um, I will build the same collaborative and productive relationships with uh, city staff that I, that I did as an employee um, with uh, both our city staff, our um, community stakeholders, other councillors, as well as residents, of course. Um, and I, will, I plan on using my expertise and experience as an OC Transpo employee to, um, to be a well-informed councillor for our community. Uh, since registering as a candidate, I've visited almost 10,000 houses in the ward to introduce myself, introduce my platform, and to listen to your uh, concerns and ideas for a uh, better community. As your councillor, I will continue to respectfully listen so that our voices are heard at the council table. And I mentioned in the beginning that my wife and I have a very personal interest in uh, making sure our community is, has a uh, healthier and sustainable uh, future. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson. Atik Qureshi, you have 60 seconds for your closing statement. At the end, I will say that being, having my experience in accounting and finance, everybody can work on the given resources. I always work with the less resources. How to utilize, uh, how people can utilize uh, their resources best in the minimum and effective way. So that is something I will uh, look into that. And I am also uh, 
uh, look that uh, that approach, the hybrid approach, as I said earlier, and uh, the way we have uh, an innovative approach. I am happy that they adopted uh, Maya uh, at the Green Bank when they put the elevated bike lanes. That was uh, my pitch on the last time. So I am very happy that it is implementing right now. So all those points which I raised, they said, those are practical points. I work on that. I plan on them. So I will deliver on them. So th thank you for your support. Thank you, Atik. Kathleen Cott, you have 60 seconds for your closing statement. Um, over the last few weeks, once a week, I have been going out and checking where the potholes are in the community, where the problems are with the playground. So my intention to that, for doing that is to make sure that people understand that I'm not just about words, I'm about action. And by showing that I'm going to take some action even before I'm elected, although I do believe once elected, you'll get to see that I advocate very well. It's all of us that need to take responsibility to remind ourselves that we're the peacekeepers. We're Canadians. That's what we do. And by getting involved and having community count, that's my objective. Neighborhood Watch is something that I feel very strongly about because we need to be able to engage and go across cult cross-cultural uh, opportunities to bring people together. That's my intention. Community counts. Vote for Kathleen. Thank you, Kathleen. All right, over to Patrick Brennan. You have 60 seconds for your closing statement, Patrick. Uh, yeah, I want to say, as I said earlier, given my experience with a finance background, uh, management, collective bargaining, and capital markets, and also uh, I've been a volunteer uh, in Nepean for a number of years with the girls' hockey, the boys' hockey, and I also coached uh, five years the East uh, Nepean Little League Eagles. And I also spent 14 years as a, a reader at uh, my local church. So I think I am the best prepared to, to move on to the role of counselor. I want to address, as I said, LRT is the number one issue. We've, we've got to restore confidence in that, uh, in that project. Also address the crime issues in Barhaven, speeding, and uh, possibly have to use cameras if necessary. Increase, increase police presence. We also have to make sure we deliver the core services, like roads. And uh, I also want to attract jobs into Barhaven uh, so people can live and work in Barhaven. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, Dominic Janelle, you have 60 seconds to wrap up. Thank you, Derek and Roger TV, for hosting this, and as well as for hosting them previously in the past. I would like to first say that Ottawa is on unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. I do feel that was important to mention as being the first to say it. Um, as well, my vision for Barhaven is to bring it into the future. What does that mean? It means to bring reliable transit to Barhaven, account for new incentives such as solar powered uh, slash pads so we don't have to rely on battery powered, uh, renovating and revolutionizing bike infrastructure incentivizing and revolutionizing what we want our communities to look like. For far too long, Barhaven has looked the same way. We, when we know there's better technologies to improve that, I'd like to bring that. That's my vision for Barhaven. If you agree with me, then I'm glad to share it. I want to bring that vision forward to yourself, which is reliable transit, a one-year tax freeze to ease the pressure on yourselves. And if you like what I bring, vote Janelle. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard Garrick, you have 60 seconds for your closing statement. Perfect. Thank you very much. You know, I've lived in this community for over 30 years, and I understand the importance of uh, being connected to what is happening in Barhaven. Remaining transparent with effective communication, that's essential in making sure that our community grows and thrives. I bring a realistic approach to this community with a strong voice. My experience will help me to advocate for the needs of residents of Barhaven, and I have worked with many different community partners, stakeholders with real on-the-ground experience, whether that's with the Ottawa Police, CHEO, or as a teacher. We need to rebuild faith in our transit system. We need to work to innovate and grow while developing sustainably. Increase programming for our youth and our seniors and engage again in transparent conversations and work to engage our residents. I'm a teacher, a former youth worker, a nonprofit coordinator, and I will and have you know, advocated for the community all my life. With my background and experience and knowledge of Barhaven, I will be your strong voice at Council. And on October 24th, I ask for your support in making me that strong voice and a leader for our community. All right, thanks to all of our candidates. Really appreciate it. Again, Ward 24, Barhaven East. And thank you at home for watching here today. We really appreciate it. Again, a reminder, Election Day is October 24th. Thanks so much for tuning in here on Rogers TV.